Welcome back to Introduction to Visual Art. This is week eight. And this week we are continuing our discussion about two-dimensional artwork. Last week we spoke about drawing. And this week we're moving on to painting. I'm sure many people, when they think about art and art museums, they think about paintings hanging on the wall. That is one of the things that's most familiar to people. Um, and it's definitely a really excellent art form. Uh, let's investigate it more. So, what is painting? Painting, the art or process of applying paints to a surface such as canvas to make a picture or other artistic composition. Perhaps second only to drawing, painting is another great point of entry into making art. Early man, too, is known to have painted their surroundings caves, objects, faces. Pigment and paint was very much a part of the lives of early humans. Also, everyone here certainly has experienced painting. My guess is that at a very young age, you made your first paintings. Do you remember painting as a child? When was the last time you painted? I certainly remember painting as a child. I was doing the old finger painting and I was got more into you know formal art painting probably around junior high before that i was mostly drawing um when was the last time you painted i personally i do paint sometimes i don't paint often uh i guess maybe a year ago i painted maybe some of you have painted within a year so what is paint? Paint is a liquid substance that converts to a solid film when applied to a surface, i.e. it dries. The color in paint comes from its pigment, granular solids in a wide chromatic range derived from chemicals and minerals. Do you remember talking about pigment with the, with the pastels in particular and crayons? So these are minerals or chemicals that are mined and extracted from around the world from some from plants but many from rare stones and and mineral deposits pigment in its powdered form must be compounded with a binding agent or vehicle to adhere to a surface so in pastels i was talking about a glue or or something but like vehicle is what is similar it is what carries the pigment so that might be water it might be oil it might be what's called acrylic the pliability or fluency of a paint is a result of its medium which is a liquid material such as like I said water turpentine or other spirits used to dilute the paint as the paint dries, the medium evaporates and is no longer part of the solid paint film. So, technically speaking, when we're talking about oil paint, there is no more real oil on the painting. There, there's maybe an oil film, but really what you have left is the dry medium because the oil evaporated. So types of painting. There's so many types of painting. Artists can and have paint, uh, they, they can paint with anything from ink, as in the washes that we talked about last week, to oil paint, or even peanut butter and motor oil. The discipline of painting is wide open and ever changing. But of course we will be talking about these. There are so many types of paint of painting uh, and paint ways to paint but these are the real traditional and common ways of paint uh, of painting so we will be talking about fresco encaustic tempera oil acrylic watercolor spray paint and experimental painting Have you guys seen this image before? 
This is a picture of what's called the Sistine Chapel. And we should remember just from being alive that the Sistine Chapel, especially the, the ceiling and the, the altar wall, was painted by an artist named Michelangelo. And the way he painted it was with the fresco uh, method. So fresco is the art of painting on plaster. Fresco paint is a mixture of pigment, like the powdered mineral, that's been dissolved into water. After spreading plaster on a wall or a ceiling, an artist would paint on the surface of the wet plaster. Ultimately, the paint and the pigment get stuck, get sucked into the plaster as it dries. So, plaster, these plaster ceilings, these frescoes are part of the plaster of the ceilings. Fresco painting was most popular during the Renaissance, the years 1300 to 1600. It re-emerged notably in popular Mexican art of the 1920s and 30s. Fresco painting. This is a detail of the altar wall of the Sistine Chapel. Something that many of you may not be quite so familiar with, but it's still equally awesome. We have different levels of, I guess, religion or judgment. So we have, I believe, judgment happening here that is probably uh, God. And he's sending people either up or he's sending people down. And so down here we have, we have essentially hell. This, so the, the painting is commonly called the Last Judgment. So these are people waiting to be judged as they, I suppose, are flying in from earth into heaven or into the in-between. Interesting here, you see a guy holding the skin of another person. So this is how, like going down that way. Another picture of hell. So you have a demon forcing people off the boat being carried into a terrible world. So there's the guy with the flayed skin. I think this is terrifying. Also, I find it a little bit funny. Uh, funny only because the concept of, of, I don't know, of a flayed skin. It sounds absolutely horrible and horrifying, but there's something that's funny about it. It seems almost like a joke, but that might just be me talking from a 21st century perspective. This is another thing that I think is kind of funny. I like to show students this. Michelangelo, as a side note, he painted this chapel. He was uh, funded in his day by a wealthy Italian family and he did a lot of work for the family and for uh, the church and work that he didn't necessarily want to do. And so Michelangelo was getting a lot of criticism for having nude figures in his artwork uh, because it is a church and it was seen as inappropriate. And so Michelangelo painted this painting, and then the person who was giving him the most trouble, who was a cardinal at the time, was actually, this is a portrait of him. So after this guy died, Michelangelo went back in and he painted the face of this guy and sort of put him in the center, well, I guess the bottom right, but in a very, you know, conspicuous area. And this whole concept this looks like torture doesn't it sort of a hidden message put in by Michelangelo 
this is an example of a resurgence of fresco painting that uh, that I mentioned happened particularly in Mexico in the 1920s, 30s, 40s. It, there was an artist named Diego Rivera who was in his day a very, very famous artist. And he was famous because he was uh, politically active, among other things. Um, he was a socialist, communist. There was a big socialist movement in Mexico around that time among the, uh, the elite. But anyway, this isn't particularly a socialist painting. This is a detail of a, a mural painted in what's called the National Palace in Mexico City. And I believe that it is that that building is a sort of seat of of power in the city and that he was commissioned to paint being the most famous Mexican artist at the time or one of the most famous. We'll get to that in a moment. He was one of the most famous Mexican artists at the time. And so he was commissioned to paint the history of Mexico City. And so we have the, a, a depiction of the Aztecs in, you have, you see all these islands with houses and buildings and pyramids and things like that. This is the, a, a depiction of what would have been called, or what we now call Tenochtitlan. And for those of you that don't know, Tenochtitlan is what became Mexico City. Mexico City is a huge city. It's the most populous or one of the most populous cities in the world. Um, and I find this a really fascinating image because it was, in fact, on, a, on water. Like Tenochtitlan was on water. And through centuries, uh, especially when the Europeans took Tenochtitlan from the Aztecs and and uh, started settling it. They drained all the water and even now these pyramids still exist but because it was built on water and essentially so soft ground they've sunk and they've started to sink. They continue to sink under the city. So uh, I've heard stories of like Mexico City digging subway tunnels and encountering layers like hitting pyramids when they're trying to dig a, tu uh, a tunnel for their subway things like that but anyway this is Diego Rivera so the interesting thing about Diego Rivera is that there was another Mexican artist that was very famous they weren't as famous as Diego Rivera when they were alive, but they are certainly way more famous now. Diego Rivera's wife, her name was Frida Kahlo. And I'm sure many of you have heard of Frida Kahlo and I'll, I'll be showing some of her artwork in these presentations, but uh, it's sort of interesting. He was a very domineering man, uh, difficult to live with, violent, alcoholic. And Frida Kahlo uh, had to put up with that crap. But together, they were the two most famous artists in Mexico at their time. All right, so moving on from, from uh, oh, I'm sorry, from Fresco is encaustic. So encaustic is a type of paint that is very old and consider the crayon from before a crayon has pigment that is suspended in wax that wax is molten when it's mixed together then it dries and then you can draw with it well encaustic is hot wax is painting with hot wax and so Artists use encaustic today with a knife or or with a paintbrush, but it was really popular back in 
what this image is from 160 CE. So that is before the Common Era. That's another uh, term for BC as opposed to BC and AD. So anyway, 160 before the year zero or maybe 279 before the year zero. So this is an encaustic painting. It is from Egypt. And this might not look like an Egyptian painting to you, but another interesting thing is around that time, there were two major world powers. You had the Egyptians and you had the Greeks. So the Greeks rose to power on their own terms and so did the Egyptians. And then they sort of flip-flopped between being world powers. And and so this painting actually looks more Greek, but that's because of a cultural sharing. The, the paint styles and technologies really uh, moved back and forth between the Greeks and the Egyptians. But anyway, this is a painting from Greece. If you notice, the colors look really good. One of the things with encaustic paint is that it is almost totally permanent, like the color doesn't fade as easily. So let's read the side. Encaustic, a method of painting where pigment colored wax is heated and applied as paint. Encaustic is one of the earliest known methods of applying color to a surface. In this pigment, in this pigment is ground up and wax is used as a vehicle. Remember vehicle, it's what the pigment moves in. Encaustic is very old and in this process colors stay remarkably vibrant. The process was commonly used by both the Egyptians and the Romans and the Greeks. Portrait of Two Brothers. So this is Egyptian, part of the Roman Empire. I did get my history a little bit confused. Greeks definitely did flip-flop with uh, the Egyptians, but that was actually before the Romans came to power. So, we're, so the Romans were in power around the year zero. And then they were in power you know, hundreds of, uh, 200 years before that and 200 years after that. So this is another Roman painting, but painted in uh, Egypt again. The paint seems to survive better than the wood that it was painted on. So this is a, a more current from the 20th century use of encaustic paint by the artist Jasper Johns. What we see here is a target in a red square. That is all painted with encaustic. What we see at the top is actually uh, wood and plaster. So these are molds of faces that are set into, or plaster faces that are set into wood. But this whole thing is encaustic. And what Jasper Johns would have done is take what's called a palette knife, which is essentially a little scraper, and apply it to, to, the, to the, the canvas, building it up really thick. And you can do that because it's wax, and wax cools very thick. And depending on how hot it is, is how thick it is when it's applied. All right, so more recent than uh, than encaustic painting is tempera paint. Tempera is still very old, and I believe, I could be wrong on this, but I believe that tempera paint outdates other paints that you might have heard of, including oil paint. Tempera is a paint that uses ground pigment suspended in egg yolk of whole eggs, then thinned with water. So this paint would get moldy if you were to keep it in a, uh, in a jar and start getting pretty rancid and smelly. But 
it was it became the preferred method for a long time because eggs were you know readily available at least among the elite and a lot of painting happened among the elite in European society so temper paint was popular for centuries but it fell out of favor in the 1300s with the introduction of oil paint temper paint is extremely durable and it provides brilliant colors. However, temper paint dries very quickly and is difficult to paint on top of. So you might have used some version of temper paint when you were growing up. I'm not sure if it would have actually had eggs in it uh, when you were you know, in kindergarten doing your finger painting. But if you remember that, it dries very quickly and the colors are very bright. It was in favor because the colors were so bright and you could get a nice smooth finish as opposed to encaustic where it was actually difficult we can compare the two so you see the different brush strokes on this guy's neck and in his face and on his hair it like the wax tends to sit on top of other parts and that that really defines encaustic. Whereas with tempera paint, you could sort of mix all the colors and then when you brush it on, it's nice and smooth and it's flat. But again, the problem was that it dried very quickly. However, they didn't know that oil paint was just around the corner. So this is an old, I believe, Italian painting. So from 1367, this is what's from a time called the Low Renaissance, which is just before what is called the High Renaissance. But the High Renaissance is what we refer to as just the Renaissance. But this is when the art is starting to get a little bit more interesting as they're emerging from uh, what's called the Middle Ages, where not much art was made. So this is at the beginning of the Renaissance. This is what's called an illuminated manuscript. And an illuminated manuscript came in the time in which people were often illiterate. And so they were visual depictions of the Bible. But also... Um, this is, again, at the beginning of the Renaissance, but coming out of the Middle Ages. And in the Middle Ages, before the Middle Ages, Europeans were making really great art. And then during the Middle Ages, they began to value art less and value religion more. And they were making art about religion. And so that's around this time you see art about religion and and so there were monks that would be in monasteries producing and reproducing the Bible and they'd, they'd spend their entire lives doing just one Bible where they would be drawing or painting and they would paint words on there but the images were very important for the time so this is from Armenia in Eastern Europe Another example of tempera paint, this is a 20th century example by an artist named Andrew Wyeth. So tempera paint is still around and it has its virtues. Artists can use it for different reasons, get a certain effect. I think that tempera paint is annoying a little bit as an artist. I think it's a little annoying because it dries so fast. But if that's what you're looking for, there's no reason why... like. If, you're looking, if an artist is looking for that quality in a paint, there's no reason why they can't um, use it, use that paint. Another one, this is from another outsider artist. You remember last week I spoke about outsider art where there was a drawing uh, done by a young woman named, actually she was older, Minnie, I, I forget her last name, but uh, it was a crayon drawing. This is another outsider artist, Jacob Lawrence. Um, 
outsider meaning someone who didn't have a formal education in art but was still driven to make art so uh that's why that looks different than that is because this guy went to school this guy did not so anyway uh tempera paint it can be very opaque you can i mean it certainly didn't it didn't take long for the artist to make these shapes and paint in the colors. All right, so oil paint. Oil paint is very commonly used today, but it took a while for it to grow into uh, favor. So oil paint, a paint that consists of ground pigments combined with linseed oil and thinned with turpentine. So linseed oil is a type of oil that comes from, you know, pressing seeds. You, you know, you've heard of the sort of sunflower. Uh, well, I don't know if you've heard of it, but you can make seeds from sunflower, or I'm sorry, oil from sunflowers. You can make oil from peanuts. So I'm, you might have heard of peanut oil. This is just a different seed that came, uh, that, that, was used at the time. Um, I'm not sure why linseed is still used today, but it is. Like tempera, the first oil paintings were on boards. However, through time, the paintings transitioned to canvas. The great advantage of oil paint is that it takes quite a long time to draw. That allows the artist to mix paint more freely and to rework problem areas as they occur. So this painting is from the mid 1600s. Uh, it's from uh, you know, so Johannes Vermeer. He was from the uh, Holland, what was then called Holland, and Holland is no longer a country. You may not know, uh, but it is part of the Netherlands. So it's sort of nor northern Europe. And anyway. There's a huge jump in realism and or sort of realistic art that goes from tempera paint. So this, you know, this is painted in the 1940s. This was painted in the 1300s. You can get realistic, like look at the fabric here and they had some issues with perspective, but you could get realistic-ish but really, they were restricted by time because the paint dried so quickly. And when you get to oil paint, time is no longer an issue. You're done with a painting before the oils dry. Often, an oil painting has to sit for a year before it is dry. Today, there are different oil paints that don't take quite as long to dry. But at the time, it would have taken a long time, and the artist... Uh, Vermeer, he would have been uh, on to the next, or maybe, you know, five paintings later when this is finally dry. So you get time to mix the colors, to blend them well, and then you start getting paintings that by our standards we would call photoreal, something that looks like it's from a picture or a photograph. This painting is also oil on canvas, and it's not photorealistic, but it is something that could not be done with tempera paint. So this, with where the way the paint is, like blends there and there, it's all soft. You wouldn't be able to blend the paint together in tempera paint. So. Oil paint is popular today even because it is very super blendable. Another example of oil paint. Certainly this could have been painted with other types of paint. But up in the 1950s, oil paint was the preferred method of paint. A more recent oil paint painting again 
this oil paint, this oil paint was put on very thick, took a long time to dry. Who knows, it might still be wet. I don't, <laughs> I have no idea. But he was able to swirl the paint around. You wouldn't be able to do that with other types of paint. So after oil paint, and this is very commonly used today, is acrylic paint. Acrylic paint is a mixture of pigment and liquid plastic that can be thinned with water. I want to emphasize that acrylic paint is neither more lasting or vibrant than oil paint. What people like about oil paint is that it is less toxic than, or acrylic paint is that it is less toxic than oil, it dries quicker, and is easier to clean up after. That's why people use it. So this painting, again, looks photo real. In fact, it would have been painted from a photograph. So this is from 1979. Acrylic paint didn't come into fashion uh, until sometime in maybe the 1950s it was developed people really started using it in the 70s um but acrylic paint there are ways to manipulate it like spraying it with water or doing other things that that really allow it to stay fluid longer but when you want it to dry it'll dry in an hour but what's different between acrylic paint and temper paint back to you know the egg yolk paint so the egg yolk paint dries in like a minute so this is sort of for some artists it's the perfect amount of time for how long it takes for the paint to dry this is acrylic by Andy Warhol, you guys might remember a very similar picture to this. This might not have been brushed, but it was, but it would have been stenciled on and still acrylic though. This is actually a, the painting is the red area and it is again, acrylic so very vibrant colors acrylic paint so this paint would have been probably sprayed on with an air uh, gun so imagine a person that you've seen videos of people spraying an even coat of paint on a car when they're painting a car you can do that on a smaller scale. So he probably used a mixture of, of a, a paintbrush, but also spraying it on. I'm sure you have heard of watercolor. Watercolor is any paint medium that employs water as a solvent. So, like oil, or acrylic there is water involved and water is what carries the pigment there are a couple types of watercolor if you want to get super specific one of them is aquarelle a transparent film of paint applied to a white absorbent surface aquarelle is the painting method most commonly most commonly referred to by the word watercolor it's okay I don't need you in the future to use the word aquarelle unless you want to impress me watercolor definitely makes sense it's the common language so if you have experience with watercolor aquarelle really is what you might have been doing gouache gouache is a watercolor compromise gouache is a watercolor comprised of a high concentration of vehicle and opaque ingredients such as chalk. Gouache was commonly used in the Byzantine and Romanesque eras of Christian art. So using the mineral, a very thick concentration of the mineral, and 
watering it down and brushing it off. This is another, I'm not sure if, I'm not sure what an art historian would call this. Um, I was about to call it an illuminated manuscript. It seems to be in the tradition of an illuminated manuscript. But this is from Iran, which uh, was not, I guess it's possible, but I'm, I'm guessing that this is not Christian. It is uh, Islam. And so the idea of an illuminated manuscript was it that occurred artwork like that was made in Europe it was made in the Middle East it was made in North Africa and something similar though not really related was really done in Asia. And so I, the reason why I say that is because Asia didn't have great communication with the Middle East or Europe or North Africa, but uh, they developed independently. Anyway, this is, I think, a beautiful example of gouache on paper. This is watercolor and gouache on paper. Watercolor tends to be fuzzy and sort of like blurred lines. And if you're to use watercolor, you really use that to quality to your advantage. So this is a very dreamlike landscape, in my opinion. It is doesn't have a lot of definition in the way that a photograph would. It feels very dreamlike. And I think that if you're trying to make a dreamlike image, watercolor might be the way to go. So this is also watercolor by an artist named Jean Dubuffet, where he was scratching the paper to create the lines and really like cutting into it. This is by, this artwork is by an interesting man, Jean Dubuffet. You might assume that this is another outsider artist, but in fact he is not. He is, I don't know, I guess a fraud and would have been a little bit, maybe people would have like looked a little bit side-eyed at him if he was making art today. Uh, because what he was doing, like he did sing, this man, Jean Dubuffet, did single-handedly introduce um, the concepts of outsider art into mainstream art world in, you know, the 40s and like maybe around 1900 he started. But what he was doing was hanging out at uh, insane asylums in France, which would have housed people with all sort of intellectual disabilities. And he would hang out with children, and he would take their ideas and reproduce them and paint them. He's very influential in the art world, but... Uh, but definitely mimicking a uh, mimicking other people and what he was doing. So gouache on paper. I mean, this is nice, simple-ish painting. Um, I think that the artist wanted to do something very quick, and he used the gouache and tempera paint to, or gouache and uh, watercolor to his advantage because he just did it very quickly. Now we're moving on to spray paint. So everyone's familiar with spray paint. So uh, why would a person use spray paint? Spray paint doesn't have to be on a building 
but why is spray paint used on the building? Well, if you were to be doing some sort of illegal painting, uh, you would be wanting to do something where you have all the colors at your fingertips. You don't have to mix them. They're ready to go. You're very quick. So that's one reason to use spray paint. Another reason is it's kind of, it kind of has these nice effects to them. So you don't have to paint graffiti on a wall. You can use them in uh, normal sort of artwork. And I think the real advantage is that it produces a style and it uh, has a predictable color and it's really quick and easy. So last week we talked about the caves in France. The This is a from the Lascaux Caves in France. So this was painted, spray painted essentially, 17,000 years ago. So what were the people doing? How were they painting these? Well, they were taking a mineral. So this might have been a red clay, like dirt, putting it in their mouth, and like chewing it up, and then they would have a reed a reed being a like something that grows by water, a tall plant like a cattail or something that is actually hollow on the inside. So they would have a, a piece of reed, like a hollow tube, and they would spit and spray the paint onto the wall. And that's how it got there. So we've got like dirt and we've got uh, probably other dirt here. And then they've got charcoal. This was all in their mouths and they were spraying them onto the wall. And this really shows that. So these people living in the caves, they were holding in this one, holding their hands up, making handprints. I think that's super cool. So these are 17,000 year old handprints. It's an interesting artist named David Ellis. He he's not like super famous, but he's someone I got to interact with uh, years ago. And his story is that he grew up in rural, like I think South Carolina, and he was interested in like punk music and skateboarding and graffiti, but he was on a farm. And so what he started doing with his friends and his friends, they, they were called, they called themselves the barnstormers. They would like literally just tag barns, like, like entire murals done on barns in rural, uh, in the rural Carolinas. So this is a normal painting or like artwork. So what do we have here? I see words that say destroyed by desire. And I see a sort of swirl of color. I see like black swirls and pink and orange and yellow and green. Well, how do you think this was made? You know, I see another, I see an image, like a photograph. This area looks like a floor. This area, I don't know, perhaps there's a wall behind. You know, I'm not sure. It's grayish, whitish. How was this made? Well, it looks to me like there was an image that was printed, perhaps, on... It says here, polished steel. Oh, you know what? It's probably the room. It's reflecting the room. Let's talk about this again. So we have polished steel, which is steel that is bright and it's shiny and it might as well be a mirror. And then they took tape and taped out the words 
destroyed by desire. And then they spray painted it. Then they peeled the tape off, and there you get the polished steel reflecting whatever it wants to reflect. So that would be the room it was installed in. This is an artist I, I used to know named Ann Keener. I think this is a beautiful painting where this is also on canvas and she wrapped the canvas in a fabric, but she painted the canvas, wrapped the canvas in the fabric and then use the fabric as a stencil. And so I believe probably painted blue on top of orange. The blue goes through and then what you're left with is what looks like an orangey fabric pattern. So that's interesting. So I want to talk about experimental painting. Experimenting is what artists do best. Here is some unconventional painting. Consider techniques and media used. Do the unconventional processes add to the artwork as a whole? What can be gained by uprooting the painting tradition? So the painting tradition being uh, using paint brushes or really, you know, stuffy, realistic painting. This artist, Jackson Pollock, and I, I hope most of you have heard of him, he was a pioneer in the art world and he really popularized what's called abstract expressionism, which is artwork that is abstract but doesn't really, it's not, it's not, it's not abstracting an object in front of in front of the artist you know it's it's just the act of paint it's all about paint and expressing yourself through paint so how was this made how do you think this painting was made you may know that the artist Jackson Pollock was famous for drip paintings so he would stand on top of it. So this painting is, is very big. It's like, what, 68 inches tall. So that is uh, less, than, less than six feet tall. And then 105 inches wide. So that is uh, less than 10 feet wide. So about six by 10. And he would lay the canvas on the floor and walk on top of it with a bucket in his hand of some color of paint and he would have a brush or a stick or whatever and he would just thwap it onto the painting or drizzle it or do whatever and that's how he made his drip paintings. Another unconventional form of painting where the artist Janine Antoni was dipping her hair into a bucket of hair color and she painted an entire floor with her hair. How do you think this picture was made? This is a large, uh, I guess it's on a piece of paper. 57 inches tall, so that is mm, five and a half feet, five, five and a half feet by, I don't know, 10, more than 10, 10 and a half feet. How was this painting made? What he did is he had a woman paint, or maybe he did, I don't know, paint the front of her body blue, and then she laid down on the floor, and then he and another person picked her up by her wrists and by her ankles, literally stamped her body onto the paper, took her off, they painted her blue again, 
stamped her again and again and again and again. So these are all different stamps of the human body. And then this is a wild artist, uh, an artist from Chicago named William Pope L. And just an example is he built a plywood wall and he uh, mixed it with, he mixed ketchup with joint compounds. A joint compound is what you use when you're doing drywall. Um, he mixed ketchup with joint compound and painted it onto the wall and then it didn't work because the ketchup messed it all up and it started like peeling off. But he's using unconventional uh, media and material for paint. This is the end of the week eight lecture. Please watch the art of the day lecture now. The quiz will be on painting and the Art of the Day presentations.